I was uh, born in uh, Iran uh, to Muslim parents. But quite an open-minded upbringing I had and um, I, religion was never really an issue for me. I didn't have to veil, I went to a mixed school. Um, education and everything was very important for my parents. I wasn't treated differently because I was a girl. And I only really understood religion after the Iranian revolution was suppressed by an Islamic movement. And then things changed so rapidly that it became so obvious how horrible religion can be when it's got political power in particular. And that's when I started really questioning religion and challenging it. I basically am um, active against um, the Islamic regime of Iran, given my background, and of course political Islam, because it is an international movement. And um, I, I work on various campaigns that sort of address and challenge this movement in various ways. One of them is the Council of Ex-Muslims, which is an atheist organization. But we call ourselves ex-Muslim because people are not really allowed to leave Islam. In, in many countries, it's a prosecutable offense. In 11, it's punishable by death. And so it's sort of a public challenge. You know, they're telling us we can't leave. We're going to do it. We're going to do it as loudly and as publicly as we possibly can. And even if your religion or atheism, your beliefs might be personal, it's not when you're being threatened or killed for it. Then it becomes a form of resistance to do it openly and publicly. I also work on women's rights issues with an organization called Fitna uh, because Islam says that women are the greatest source of fitna and calamity in society. We've called ourselves fitna and we say we are fitna, we are Islamism's worst fitna and it is the women's liberation movement that will bring Islamism down and hopefully push it back into the dark ages. When you look at any sort of religious rule, one of its first targets are women, and Islam is no different. It's just worse, I think, because it's going through what I call an Islamic inquisition, or it's a form of totalitarianism. And so many of the religious edicts on women are actual law, and misogyny is Im implemented uh, by the state. Um, and, and so that's what makes it a very dangerous and misogynist phenomenon. So for example, a women, um, have to be segregated from men in many public spaces like racial apartheid they have to enter separate government offices doors for example uh, but it's based on gender uh, women uh, for example can't s study certain fields or they can't work in certain occupations because they're deemed to be too emotional they're not allowed to travel without a male guardian and then there's the you know the criminal code where women who have sex outside of marriage can even be stoned to death and in Iran, for example, uh, you know, the, the outrage is that stoning isn't illegal, but the size of the stone is. So it can't be too small to take too long and it can't be too big so that it ends too quickly. In that sense, I think uh, challenging the, the status of women and defending women's rights uh, defends all of uh, society because no society can really be free without women being free. Part of it has to do with the fact that this is a very threatening movement and people are genuinely afraid. Part of it has to do with this sort of, um, you know, the, 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 the pro-Islamist left, and I'm on the left myself, who consider criticism of Islam as racism. It's not criticizing ideas, beliefs, misogyny is not racism. It's in fact the height of anti-racism, you know, treating people equally, demanding that irrespective of their background, they're treated equally. Part of it has to do with, you know, this sort of, um, a, a racism of uh, lower expectations. We can handle criticism, but they can't, you know, and, and that's not the case. Some of the greatest criticisms against Islam and Islamism can be found in countries where, um, you know, it, there's Islamic rule. In Iran, the jokes against Islam, against the ruling elite, against the clergy is unbelievable. You know, most probably they would all be accused of Islamophobia here. So, I mean, I think Islamophobia is one of the other reasons why. But again, I think that's really a, a, a term to scaremonger people into silence. That doesn't mean that racism doesn't exist. It's real and we need to stand up against it um, everywhere. Um, 
But on the other hand, we also need to uh, be able to criticize Islam, to criticize Islamism, and to make clear that criticizing beliefs is not the same as attacking believers. People often ask, aren't you afraid of their threats and intimidations? And my response is always that actually they're afraid of us. I mean, when they shoot a 15-year-old girl uh, for trying to go to school in Pakistan, Malala Yousafzai, when they, you know, stone women to death for merely the act of loving, you know, uh, when they uh, throw acid in the faces of women because they're not properly veiled, it shows how terrified they are of us, in fact, and how and why it's so important for us to stand up and be heard um, and, and push them back. This is the way, usually, throughout history, this form of barbarity and totalitarianism has been pushed back in public, in full force. I don't think I could wake up in the morning, or, or anyone could, if they didn't have hope, you know. And I'm very hopeful because I think that, uh, uh, particularly because I work um, with many people and groups and organizations who are opposed to Islamism and who are doing it at great risk to themselves on the front lines. Um, you know, when you get to see that resistance, the, the immense resistance, despite all odds, I think it's impossible not to be hopeful.